broadcast, and I hope it's a real blessing to you. Will you turn in your Bible with me today to Romans chapter 4? I appreciate you watching the broadcast every week, and uh, I'd like to challenge you to get a pencil and a piece of paper and write down the scripture references every week as we give them to you. And I'd like to challenge you to search them out and see whether the things that we say are true. I would also appreciate hearing from you. I have no way of knowing uh, if you listen to the broadcast unless I hear from you. And so I would appreciate very much getting a letter from you. Uh, if you have uh, any kind of comment, it doesn't matter if it's bad, if you dislike the broadcast, I would appreciate hearing pertaining to that. Uh, but anyway, please write to me. I want to talk to you today about justification. Uh, in the Bible, in Romans chapter 4, and keep in mind that we're going to believe the Bible. Uh, I'm reading from the King James Bible. The King James Bible is the Word of God. I believe that it means exactly what it says, as it says it, where it says it. It must be rightly divided. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we understand that all of the Bible is written for us. In other words, I get uh, admonition, I get learning by reading the whole Bible. But Paul's epistles is written to us in that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. The Gentiles seem to have the preeminence during this period of time. Paul was given the dispensation of the grace of God. We live now in the dispensation called the grace of God. And so we must rightly divide the word of truth, understanding now, once again, all of the Bible is for us. We get admonition. We, get, we learn certain things from Genesis through Revelation. But the message that is directly to us as Gentiles in the dispensation of grace is found in Paul's epistles. You cannot find justification for the Gentile in this age in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can't find it in the book of Hebrews or the book of Revelation. You find it in Paul's epistles. Now, in Romans chapter 4, notice how that Paul describes this justification. Now, the point being, before I go any further, before we read, please understand that somebody, somewhere, is going to try to tell you that if you want the real truth about justification, you're going to have to read James chapter 2. But James didn't know the message that is given to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4. Isn't it fascinating that when you read the book of James, if you read it closely, that you will find that the majority of the material that he writes in the book has to do with the Sermon on the Mount. James, the writer of the book, had his head cut off in Acts chapter 12. Therefore, the book of James itself would have had to have been written somewhere after uh, Luke 24 and Acts chapter 12. It would have been written very early. He would not have known the doctrine that was committed to the Apostle Paul, which, if you remember, in our Bible classes for the past several weeks, we've been discussing the mystery. James didn't know this mystery that was committed to the Apostle Paul. Hence, the justification that he refers to in James chapter 2 is not the justification by faith referred to by the Apostle Paul. It is the justification by works that the tribulation saint will receive. The tribulation saint will have to work for his salvation. He will have to work for his justification. Please compare, not now, but write down on your piece of paper there, Matthew chapter 16, starting in about verse 24. Jesus told those people that in effect, if you give up your life, you will save your life. But if you save your life at that time, you will lose your life. The implication being the individual that endured to the end of his life would be saved. In other words, he would have eternal life in resurrection. But those who did not endure, those who did not hold out, those who did not die the martyr's death and so forth, 
they would not have eternal life. They would not be perfected in resurrection. Not so with the Apostle Paul. In Paul's writings and Paul's writings alone, do you have exalted the complete finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary, you see everything that we as Gentiles have in relation to God is that which was committed to us by God through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 4 verse 1, the Bible said, What should we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Now please observe it has something to do with the flesh. Verse 2, For if Abraham were justified by works, obviously he's referring to the works of the flesh, he hath wore up to glory, but not before God. In other words, if you can justify yourself by the good deeds of your flesh, you would have something to brag about in eternity, and God won't permit that. Uh, verse 3, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. What did Abraham do to be righteous? Well, he believed God. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to be wise to get a grip on that. You don't have to be educated to understand that. That is very clear. What did Abraham do to be righteous? Well, he believed God. What did he believe? Well, God said, Abraham, your children will outnumber the stars of heaven. Your seed will be more than the stars of heaven. And the old man just bowed his head and said, Amen. In other words, he believed God, and God counted that belief unto him for righteousness. Now in verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. In other words, if, if God had said unto you, this do, and thou shalt live, and then you did it, God would be indebted to give you life. If God promised you eternal life by your good works, and you did the good works, God would have to give you eternal life. He'd be indebted to you, but he isn't gonna, he isn't gonna be indebted to you. Verse five, but to him that worketh not, but, believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. In other words, if you don't work good works, if you've never done any good work in your life where God is concerned, but if you will believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believing that he died for your sins at Calvary and that was buried and that God raised him from the dead, God will count your belief in that gospel for righteousness, even though you've always done bad. If you have, all, if you have admitted that you've been bad, maybe you've been a drunk, maybe you've been a whore, maybe you've been a whoremonger, maybe you've been an adulterer, maybe you've been a fornicator, maybe you've been a thief or a robber, Whatever you've been is not the issue discussed here. What is the issue discussed here? To him that worketh not doesn't do anything good for God. To him that worketh not does not keep any kind of commandments. To him that worketh not doesn't walk the aisle for Jesus, as they say. To him that worketh not does not pray through at the altar. To him that worketh not doesn't get baptized for remission of sins. To him that worketh not, does not join the church, does not make any deals with God. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You couldn't miss that if you tried, if you believe the Bible means what it says. In other words, God Almighty has the power today to save you, justify you, and make you righteous by your belief in what Christ did for you at Calvary. Jesus Christ went to Calvary for you and became your sin at Calvary. The Bible said God made him to be sin. Him who knew no sin became our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him.
In other words, everything that needed to be done, all the work that needed to be done to get you out of this world and get you into heaven was done by Christ at Calvary. You do not need to work righteousness to be saved. What do you need? Well, you need a Savior. Who is that Savior? Jesus Christ is that Savior. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. To him that worketh not, doesn't do good works, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Who does he justify? He, un he justifies the ungodly. Look in chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Who did Christ die for? Did Jesus Christ die for good people? Why, he said, I came not to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Jesus gave an illustration. He said, two men went up in the temple to pray. He said, one was a Pharisee, that'd be the good guy. The other, a publican, that'd be the bad guy. And he said, the Pharisee prayed thus with himself, and he said, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I mean, he just, he just spouting out. He goes on and on with this goodness, trying to impress God, and finally turned to the publican over there and said, I'm glad I'm not as that publican. But Jesus Christ said that that publican wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven but just smote on his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus Christ said, that publican, that lowly sinner, went away justified rather than the Pharisee. Why can you not get that? Why can you not see that your righteousnesses are filthy in the eyes of Almighty God? Why can you not see that all the things that you can do is just of the flesh. And the only thing acceptable unto Almighty God is the work of His Son. Believe in His Son. Receive His Son. Claim His Son as your Savior. God will justify you. Look at the verse again. In Romans 5, verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for who? The ungodly. Can you admit that you're an ungodly sinner. Look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Who did Christ die for? Well, he died for sinners. One of the greatest enemies to the Bible, the greatest enemies to the Lord today is religion. So what does religion do? Religion teaches you that if you be good, God will accept you. Well, you try to be good all your life and you end up in hell. You try to do good works all your life to get into heaven and you won't gain heaven, you'll gain hell. Why, in Matthew chapter 7, he refers to some individual that comes to him at some judgment somewhere and that individual says, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils in thy name and done many wonderful works in thy name? But he said... Then would the Lord say unto that man, Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Well, doing good works won't get you to heaven. What will get you to heaven? Believing in the good work of the Son of God. What is that good work? Well, he died for you at Calvary, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. So what is the work of Jesus Christ? Death. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, that by one man sin entered in the world. That man is Adam. It says that by one man's offense, we were made sinners. By one man's disobedience, all were made sinners. But by the obedience of one, we should be made righteous. In other words, we became sinners because of Adam's sin. Death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. We were born in sin. We had nothing to do with that. And yet, the condemnation of sin is upon us because of the nature that we received from our forefathers. But he said, by the obedience of one 
shall many be made righteous. So what is that? You just obey the gospel call, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You believe that Jesus Christ died. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ died the death. So if you've got him as your Savior, then the debt's paid. Who did Jesus Christ die for? Well, he died for the ungodly. He died for sinners. Look in verse 10. The verse says, For if when we were enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his Son. It is enemies that Jesus Christ died for. It is sinners that he died for. It is the ungodly that he died for. Are you an ungodly, sinful enemy of God? Has that been your life in the past? Then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Somebody said, but Brother Moore, <laughs> I just can't believe it and work like that. That's just too simple. Am I to believe that Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth, would lay down His deity, lay down His crown, and leave heaven's glory and come to this filthy, stinking pot called the earth today, come into this stinking, rotten world, ruled over by the devil and the demons and the powers of the air? Do, am I to believe that He would come into all this mess and this junk and this sin and degradation and die for my sins and then complicate it so that I couldn't understand Understand that? What am I nuts? Hey folks, I got sense enough to walk through the woods without bumping into the trees. I mean, after all, I can believe what the book says. What does the book say? It says unto you, sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you at Calvary. It says unto you that are ungodly that Jesus Christ died for you. It says unto you, enemy of God, that Jesus Christ bore your sin at Calvary, that he became your sin, that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. God Almighty pleaded with you, put out his arms to you, stretched out his arms with a gospel message going forth and said, come unto me, I'll give you rest. You want peace? Come to the Lord. How can you do that? We well, can't do it at an old-fashioned altar. You can't do it by walking forward in some church. You can't do it by being baptized as a baby or being dunked in water as an adult. How can you come to the Lord? By faith. Faith in what? Believe that Jesus Christ died for you at Calvary, was buried and rose again. Believe the gospel. Why? The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He said, it, the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Think about it. What is the power of God to save your never-dying, miserable soul? It's the gospel. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Well, what is the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that the gospel whereby the Corinthians were saved, the same gospel whereby Paul was saved, was that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's simple. Jesus Christ went to Calvary, and God Almighty made Him to be your sin, transferred your sin unto His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and poured out His wrath upon your sin at Calvary, and Christ paid the debt for your sin in death for your sin, that you, by believing that truth, could be saved eternally. You can't beat that. Why, then, would you fool around with some doctrinal religious system that tells you that if you be good, you'll go to heaven. Why, the Bible tells me in Romans chapter 3, he said in Romans 3, there's none good, no, not one. He said they've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said there's none justified by the law. Listen to me. If I look back there in my Bible, I find that at about 1500 B.C., the law was given through Moses. 1500 years before Christ, the law was given. I come down and I say that Jesus Christ died at that point right there. That had been in A.D. 33, Jesus Christ died. 
Then Paul wrote over here, I'm going to just say in round figures, I'm going to say about A.D. 58, something like that, Paul wrote the book of Romans. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, he said that no man is justified by the law. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Get the picture. For 1,558 years, men had kept the law. For 1,558 years, they'd had the priesthood in the temple, the glorious priesthood dressed in their robes with their crowns on their heads, with their breastplate on. They had appeared before God over and over and over. They had offered bulls. They had offered sheep. They had offered goats. They had offered doves. They had offered pigeons. Blood and blood and blood had been sacrificed the law had been abided by on and on and on for 1,558 years and still not one individual had been justified by that law. And yet there's somebody listening to me right now that are convinced if you keep the law, you'll be justified. What is wrong with you? If those to whom the law was given, if those that had the priesthood and the sacrifices and that glorious temple and all of those things that went with it, if they never became justified by the law, why do you think that you're ever going to manage it? Why, the Bible says, by the works of the law that no flesh justified. Look in Romans chapter 3. In Romans 3 verse 19. Now we... Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. In other words, the law brings guilt, not salvation. Verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Not one individual justified by the law. Think about it. Turn please to Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, verse 30. Romans 9, 30 says, What shall we say then? Answer, That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. You see, if I put up here and I say this line up here represents the nation Israel. That's Israel up there. They were given the law. They were given the covenants and all those things. Down here, the lowly Gentile. The Gentile had not the law. He had nothing. Now, so what should we say, he said? He said that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness. You see, the Gentiles that we're referring to here never tried to keep the righteousness of the law that was given to Israel up here. They never followed after that law of righteousness. But what did they do? They had obtained to righteousness by faith. Isn't that something? But look at the next verse, verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. In other words, Israel, who had the law, they had the priesthood, they had the sacrifices and the service and the covenants and all of those things, they never attained unto righteousness. Why? Verse 32, verse uh, 32, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumble at that stumbling stone, which of course is Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Isn't that simple? The Bible is clear. There are those of you that you say you believe the Bible until you come right down to the nitty gritty, and even though the Bible is clear that these things are true, some of you will say, now, Brother Moore, my grandma and my grandpa believe so and so, and if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me, and on and on. 
I understand that. I've been through that for years. But listen, what your forefathers believed is not going to solve anything for you. If you know what the Bible says and you reject what it says, then there's condemnation left for you. Notice what it says about the law again in Galatians. Turn please to Galatians. I look in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Notice in Galatians 3 verse 10. You that are keeping the commandments, you that believe if you work good, you're going to be saved. And you can't work anything better than keeping the commandments. I mean, if you're going to be good, then keep in mind that Jesus Christ said the law is tied up in this statement, thou shalt, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and thy neighbors thyself. Now, if you want to fulfill the righteousness of the law, then you've got to love God with all your heart. You've got, to, you've got to love Him with all your soul. You've got to love Him with all your mind. You've got to love Him with all your strength. In other words, all your heart. No other one can come before the Lord in your life in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Now, you understand that? If there's anybody that you spend more time with because of your love for them, than you do with God, if you put them in front of God in any way, then you haven't loved God with all your heart, all your mind. You've got to concentrate on the things of God 24 hours a day. All your soul, that's your emotions. You get emotional about God. You love God and on and on. And all your strength. In other words, whatsoever you do, you'd have to do for God. And then, to top it all off, he said, in thy neighbors thyself. Well, that's rough, isn't it? I mean, love every individual in this world just like you love yourself. You see, God fixed it so that you can't do that. He fixed it so if you'd believe that, you'd be condemned. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, as many as of the works of the law under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continue not in all things which is written in the book of the law to do them. So how can you be saved then? Forget about keeping the law. Forget about working good. Forget about joining the church, praying at the altar, and believe the gospel. What is that? That Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Accept the truth, believe the truth, and be saved by grace through faith. I thank you for listening today. Until next time, good day. Thank you, Brother Morgan, and 